Hello and welcome to another Science Book Club where I'm just as surprised as you are people are still agreeing to do this with me. My victim today is Ryan Ridden Harper, a PhD student at the Australian National University. Ryan, thanks for joining me. I didn't know I was going to be a victim. Ah, uh, well, we'll find out. Uh. So Ryan works on surveys and things like the Kepler mission. Can you tell me a bit about that? So the Kepler Space uh, Telescope was sent up in 2009 to look for extrasolar planets. So those are planets orbiting around distant stars. But it broke in 2013, so they had to rejig what they're going to do with Kepler. So what it's been doing for the past couple of years is looking at different patches of the sky in very fast intervals, so 30 minute observations, trying to see whatever might be there. Now there have been some people that have looked for supernova and other explosions inside the Kepler data. But my objective at the moment is to take all of the Kepler data, search every single pixel that it's downloaded, and try and find if there's an explosion that's gone off that no one's seen before. Ah, okay. So you're looking for supernovae? Yeah, any, anything that explodes pretty oh, much. Oh, so just any change? Yeah, yeah. And so, and so if it's every 30 minutes, then you've got a very good update rate on what's going on in the night sky. Extremely good. So Kepler is pretty much all by itself in the, the category of looking quickly at things. Mm -hmm. So now we've got TESS, which is kind of Kepler 2.0, which does a better job for nearby objects. But Kepler itself is a phenomenal instrument. It's a shame it's broken, but the fact that it broke was good for me. And it broke a few years ago, so you've got years of data, or is this mm. a survey that started in... Uh, so it's not a survey that started recently? No, well, it is. So I've created what we call the background survey, where I've right. been looking at all these pixels. But the looking for supernova in Kepler data has been happening since 2013. Right, OK. That sounds great. So this week, Ryan and I have both bought books that do explain science, though, in different ways. I've got Richard Feynman's Six Easy Pieces and Six Not So Easy Pieces. And Ryan's brought a very famous one by George Gamow. Yep. So what have you brought, Ryan? I've brought Mr. Tompkins. So it's a, it's a beautiful book written by a physicist in the early, uh, about 1920s or so. And it's beautiful because it goes through all the different kind of extremes of physics, but puts them in kind of real-world contexts. Yes, I've heard of this book. It's something my lecturers mentioned when I was going through undergrad. Uh, they told me there were things like uh, tiger, quantum tigers diffracting through trees yep. and things like that. No, that, that's, that's, so he goes into <coughs> different places in dreamlands because he habitually falls asleep all the time. Ah, so, and he oh, has, so it's, it's inspired off students? Yes, yes. Right. So he has these whacked out dreams where some physical constant is changed to be effectively equal to, to one, so everything gets messed up. So this case of the tiger, the, the quantum constant, like uh, Planck's constant H, gets close to one, so big things start to exhibit quantum properties. Right. And they're on an expedition inside the, the quantum jungle, uh, where, where a tiger attacks them, and it's uh, like an electron buzzing around an atom, the tiger's buzzing all around them. Ah, okay. Well, so the, the book is short stories, lots of, lots yeah. of individual short stories, not one continuous plot. So, so here's, here's a bit clever. So there's one overarching plot which doesn't matter at all, okay. and there's a bunch of short stories which um, are the, the meat of the stories. Right. So what else? So you've got electron tigers. Yeah. What, what other kind of things does he do? My personal favourite one is where he goes into a dreamland where the speed of light is about 30 miles per hour. So uh -huh. Does he try to drive a car in that dreamland? Well, he sees people like biking around, and I, it's been a while, but I think he does drive a car. Um, and everything just kind of gets messed up, of course, because the, the effects of special relativity are completely apparent in that world. So the, the effects being uh, length contraction and time dilation. Uh, so there's this uh, one, one thing that I've always remembered, uh, ever since I started attempting to read it many years ago, oh. that uh, when it, it would be faster for him to crack an egg and put it in a pan and just shake it back and forth than it would be to actually try and fry it. Because of relativistic effects? Yes. Ah, okay. So, you say you started this years ago. Mm. Is it a hard read? No, I'm just lazy. Right, fair enough. <laughs> so you're, you're a PhD student, you're busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll say that, sure. Uh, yeah, but I started it in high school um, after my brother kind of printed off a copy and started reading it himself. Uh, so uh, I've, I've always been reading it. I'm getting close now. Okay. Oh, so you're not quite finished? Oh, there's still, still some more wackiness to go. Oh, okay. Uh, recently, 
the most recent section I looked at was about um, Maxwell's Demon. Yes, I've heard of that one. Yeah, which is well, I've heard of Maxwell's Demon. I haven't heard the story. Yeah, that, 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 that story is strange in itself. I do recommend reading it though. It's if, especially if you haven't had any experience trying to conceptualize, conceptualize the effect. Sorry, there's a bird yeah, back there. There's a bird been hopping on my bike. It's very <laughs> distracting. But anyway, it's a good book for trying to conceptualize um, the extremes of physics if you haven't like, dealt with it before, or even if you're an undergrad just trying to get your head around these weird So effects. you think it is a good way to learn the concepts? It's not just a, a tripped out story? No, it's a really good way to learn the concepts, I think. So, oh, so, so it's well written and a good way to learn the yeah. concepts? Oh, okay. Oh, I look forward to reading it in the future because it's something I've been meaning to go and take a look at because mm. it is one of those famous ones that you hear about from your lecturers. Yeah. But I've never managed to find the time. Mm. So I've got another a way to learn physics from a slightly different bent. So we've got another mm. famous physicist, Richard Feynman. Um, Richard Feynman, like George Gamow, is probably in every physicist's, physicist's top ten mm. physicists. You know, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so he's not quite up there with the Einstein and Newton for fame, mm. but every physicist knows about him and probably every, I guess, male physicist probably wants to be a bit like him. Yeah, he was a very eccentric character. Very eccentric, but very, very smart. D uh, gave us, uh, developed physics a lot. Mm. He gave us things like quantum electrodynamics, uh, yeah. along with others, but he won the Nobel Prize for his work. Very, very good physicist and mathematician, very good theoretical physicist. He's famous for things like working on the Challenger disaster. He was the only mm. scientist consulting on the Challenger disaster after Challenger blew up, and he famously demonstrated with a glass of ice water and a bit of rubber mm. how the cold on the day had damaged an O-ring on the mm. space shuttle. But um, so Feynman, towards the end of his career, had been asked to give lectures for undergrads. He'd mostly lectured postgraduates uh, post or higher year levels at university. He was asked to give first and second year lectures. And so he developed what became the Feynman Lectures, a very, very famous series of lectures. And in some ways they missed the mark. And mm. then even Feynman himself recognised this in the introduction. And I think it, the introduction to the Feynman Lectures is reprinted in here. Yes, it is. Mm. Um, so this has the introduction to the Feynman Lectures. He recognises that he missed the mark. Okay. He didn't do a very good job of teaching the students. Okay. But, uh, so students found it extremely difficult to go away, learn from these lectures and pass an exam. Mm. But in terms of teaching you the concepts of this physics, they are fascinating. Yeah. Lots of graduate students and professors who already understood this material turned up to Feynman's lectures because Feynman was very yeah. good at finding a different way of understanding a concept. Mm. And so six easy pieces and the sequel six not so easy pieces, well I've got them in the same book here, mm. are 12 of the lectures from the series that had less maths in mm. and were just more about him explaining the concepts and so they're easier to follow without any maths. Right. And they cover a huge swath of modern physics that is still up to date today. So he goes from atoms to relativity, things like conservation of energy, so the basics, and so curved space, space time, um, important mm. things like symmetry laws, so how you get conservation of energy and things like that. So it is the basics of modern physics that every physicist needs to know, mm. explained in very interesting ways. So the first time I read this, I was in my second year, Mm. And so I'd learnt some of it, but not all of it, and it helped me better appreciate the stuff I already understood. But it was tricky to get the bits that I didn't yet understand, yeah, yeah. because he... But, but when I came to read it later on, mm. I found it fascinating because it explains in a different mm. way. And so these are basically excerpts from the Feynman Lectures. And although the Feynman lectures aren't brilliant for lecturing, mm. a lot of lecturers will base their lectures on the Feynman yeah. lectures and say, okay, well, so these are the concepts I need to teach the students, mm. but I'm going to do them in a different way. And so when I've had to lecture, I've done the same thing. I've gone to this book, I've had to teach general relativity, and so I've gone to the chapter on general relativity yeah. in this book and found out how do I go about yeah putting the concepts in order, mm. getting the key concepts that I need to explain to the students and in ways that 
someone new to this might understand. So it's a really neat way of kind of formalizing ideas on these topics. Yeah, so for anyone who hasn't done physics to a university level, mm. this is a very interesting read just from the point of view of popular science. It does a pretty good job of explaining a huge range of modern physics to someone who hasn't learnt physics mm. before, but for any student of physics at university or even someone who's got a PhD and is going on to lecture, mm. it's also a very, very good and fascinating resource. And he gets quite philosophical mm. as well. There's a chapter on the relation of physics to other sciences. Okay. So Feynman, I wouldn't say he took offence to the idea that we apportion different sciences yeah. into different things, that we have chemistry and geology mm. and physics and psychology. He, Feynman appreciated that they're all part of a whole, yeah. that no science is an island in itself, mm. they all feed into each other, and so he takes time to say that yeah. and explain that, and that these are just sort of human distinct, ar arbitrary distinctions yeah, yeah. really between different fields that, don't, that nature doesn't care mm. about. The nature is working to a set of laws and it doesn't care whether we call them geology or physics. No. It's all applied mathematics. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Where does pure math stand in that? I don't know. I don't, it doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So I highly recommend this book to anyone who's interested in studying physics for fun or is actually studying it at a university level at any point in their course, at any point in their studies, whether PhD or post-PhD. Six easy pieces mm. is pretty easy to get. Uh, Penguin Classics do it. So you can pick it up in just about any bookshop with a science section or any airport bookshop. Mm. I fail to go through about any airport without seeing six easy pieces in the Penguin section. Um, not so, The six not so easy pieces, a bit harder to get yeah. your hands on. You might have to go to the internet, but both well worth a read, mm. both very interesting. And I thought it'd be an appropriate one to offset because yours is by a famous physicist, yep. but doing it from a, fic a science fictional point yeah, of yeah. view, whereas this is well in the realms of non-fiction. Yeah. This is almost textbook, yeah. popular science level, but also by a very famous physicist who was similar mindset in mm. many ways. Bo both were quite eccentric. Mm. Both had a, a jovial look at the world and a playful look on physics and life in general. Yeah. So, Ryan, thank you very much for My joining pleasure. me today. I look forward to reading Gamble's books in the future. Yes, we'll have to do this again sometime. Cheers. See you around. <laughs>